So I wanted to tell you about the inspiration for our theme, Monitoring for Sustainability. And it is actually David Attenborough. Earlier this year, I watched his film, A Life on This Earth, three times. <laughs> and I, I really recommend it. He, he uses a, a Dickinsonian approach to telling us about what's happening on the planet. And he, he starts with, it's all in parallel with his own life. And he starts back in his early career and he talks about the amount of wilderness that existed on the planet. And he kind of brings you through to the, to the present and, and shows how conditions have been changing and so forth. And, and you know, that we are at this kind of crisis point with climate and environment, biodiversity, and so forth. And then he's sort of like the, who are the three spirits that are showing Scrooge away? <laughs> and, and so he says, but you know what? It doesn't need to be like that. And there's a very simple thing that we need to do to make a future that is sustainable, sustainable for nature, sustainable for humanity. And all we need to do is think about as we make our choices in the actions and the things that we do, is this something that's going to lead to sustainability? Is it going to help people get the food and energy that they need in a sustainable way? Is it going to help sustain biodiversity? Is it going to help sustain air quality? All of these things um, that we need to do, we just ask ourselves as we do something, is this helping towards that goal of sustainability or not? And so I got to thinking about, okay, well, how would that approach apply to the NADP? And then I started thinking, and here's where I have to like come back to my little notes. Um, so as we continue to um, evolve as, as um, an organization, we can be choosing things that actually Dave already introduced some of them that we're doing, making sure that the pollutants that we measure are relevant to decision makers and that we are using our network uh, to its best capacity for tracking the pollutants that really matter. Um, and are we serving the country equitably? Are we um, including people that live in urban areas and other areas? Are they benefiting from the work that we're doing? And is there any way we can increase uh, participation and inclusivity in our monitoring and data use? And of course, can we keep our system sustainable, our costs and the resources that we use? Can we, can we um, keep those um, minimized and and then our long term goal of of data quality and accessibility, we want to be able to maintain that so that um, we can maintain our very good reputation, so I think into the future, we are doing some of these things already Dave mentioned them and I was so enthusiastic when I read about Elena. Uh, craft in uh, this um, this past summer's issue of special a special summer issue of um, the Environmental Defense Fund Solutions magazine because I thought oh here's somebody that's doing some of the hard things that that we need to be thinking about how we can do them and uh, she is an amazing scientist uh, to begin with that she has a degree in biology. She also has a master's degree in toxicology from North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and PhD from Duke University. She's the vice president of climate and health at, an, at the Environmental Defense Fund. And she's also an adjunct assistant professor at University of Texas Health Sciences Center, Center and Texas A&M University, and a kinder fellow at Rice University. So like the NADP, she has great credentials. <laughs> And, and I think the really key thing is, like, as for us, you know, how do you use those credentials to make a difference, to bring science to community, to bring help 
create a sustainable future. And so she's going to be telling us about the things that she's doing in that realm to track air pollutants, help communities monitor air pollutants, look at how climate is affecting air quality, and then how to help communities uh, get the data that they need to make good policy and planning decisions into the future. So with that introduction, <laughs> I'd like to invite Elena to give us uh, her talk. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation uh, to be here. Um, Linda was so enthusiastic in her invitation. Uh, I just am so grateful to be part of this and the whole team, David and, and everyone uh, who helped to, to make this possible. I'll say, um, you know, first off, just anything having to do with monitoring and, and air quality, it seems to be a, a labor of love. And uh, I've you know, really, we do this work um, because we know how important it is uh, day in and day out. And um, just hearing some of the remarks from um, the other presenters earlier, uh, uh, it resonates um, that this is, is exactly that type of group. So um, kudos to you all for, for your day in and day out um, work. Let's see. Okay, so in case uh, you don't know a lot about EDF, uh, we are an organization that was uh, founded by scientists actually in 1967. They were scientists who were concerned about the pesticide DDT, if you remember that one. Uh, they were spraying it all over the country to help control mosquitoes. And um, the scientists uh, determined that uh, it was the DDT that was causing the eggshell thinning uh, for some of our most famous birds. And so they went to um, the county and asked them to stop using it. The county said, no, it's great at killing mosquitoes. And so the lawyers did, or the, the scientists did something that is um, unheard of back then, more common today, but they teamed up with lawyers to go to court on behalf of the environment. And um, they won. Uh, and in the process, they actually uh, uh, geared up so much support across the country that they decided to incorporate. And so that's how EDF was, was founded over 50 years ago. And I mention that because um, I think it really shows that at EDF, uh, science is at the core of all of the work that we do, as well as all the um, advocacy um, that we promote. Um, we work uh, very constructively with corporate uh, entities. Um, we do a lot of oil and gas work. Um, we also do a lot of disaster response, um, specifically as related to climate related disasters. We um, are in the air quality business uh, too. And um, the slide here is, uh, shows the methane sat, which is a satellite that's gonna be launched um, next year. That's gonna be capturing some of the highest resolution um, methane measurements uh, to date. So we are engaged in, or have been engaged in a number of monitoring campaigns. I thought I would just share an overview of those campaigns. They're both fixed site and mobile. And, um, uh, you know, I think one of the things that's most important about the monitoring campaigns is the ability to communicate what you're measuring and what you're monitoring um, to the public. If there's not a good understanding or use of the information, then, um, you know, it's sort of like, well, why are we doing this if it's, if it's um, not being used? And so I think it's um, incredibly important and figuring out how do we grow that, um, that work uh, moving forward. And another lesson that I think is inherent to the day-to-day -day work that at least our team does is that we recognize that this work is really embedded in um, equity and justice concerns. Um, the acknowledgement of the environmental racism that has persisted across the country um, for decades. Uh, most of the time, we are out there measuring toxic releases in fence line communities. Um, they're near homes, they're near schools, um, and they're right next to uh, industrial, large scale industrial facilities. 
in Houston, which is where a lot of my work particularly is focused, um, there is no zoning there. So um, it adds a, a specific complication um, to air quality management um, in a way that, that doesn't exist in lots of other parts of the country. You could have a, a school right next to um, a large scale industrial facility. And I wanted to <clears throat> um, just share a vignette of uh, what happened after Hurricane Harvey, which was really what catapulted our disaster response work um, in from our Texas office is actually related to Hurricane Harvey. I'm sure everyone remembers that. Um, we recognized that um, when that hurricane was uh, was coming, because the Houston area has roughly 570 chemical plants, nine refineries, um, a couple hundred cement batch plants, um, and 80 metal recycling facilities, we recognize that all of these facilities were at risk um, during the hurricane. And so just uh, this story tells a little bit about a breakdown of what happened when one of those facilities um, had been damaged. So the, the um, hurricane made landfall on, on August 25th. We got five feet of rain in five days. Um, Valero, the Valero facility um, had um, an increase in benzene emissions. They reported an increase in benzene emissions of 6.7 pounds, but no one ever actually measured that. And so um, the community around that facility actually started calling the city, um, started calling enforcement uh, agencies to come out and measure, and no one could really get there fast enough. Um, and so we coordinated with city officials to have a unit come out actually from California uh, to measure for benzene um, in this area. The first measurement that they took, um, they got concentrations that exceeded 300 part per billion benzene. Um, just for context in the urban area, benzene um, doesn't usually get over 10 um, part per billion. So this, these were extremely high concentrations that were being measured um, that were confirmed by um, a, a number of different instruments. This is the first time that we've ever done anything like this, but we issued an air quality health alert um, after we got these measurements because um, it was something that we just had not seen and had not been reported before. We talked with EPA, talked with um, city of Houston officials to figure out um, what should be done. Um, and finally, uh, we had some agencies come in, take measurements, but they never released that information to um, the public. And, um, you know, this is where that communication is really important. Um, EPA in, ended up saying that that facility had underreported their emissions, um, but they still never gave the data. Um, they wanted Valero to release that information. Valero um, released information saying that they actually, instead of the 6.7 pounds, they were, had released 1,800 pounds. TCQ releases a statement, that's our state environmental agency, about the monitoring results. This was 39 days later. Um, and, you know, as a result of all of this, um, we were actually able to partner with the city of Houston. They actually got some funds from CDC to purchase um, a mobile unit that could be deployed in these disaster events. Um, and that's important because we didn't have the, um, the resources and the, the monitoring equipment that we needed to handle this particular case. Um, and you know still to this day um that the issue about the underreporting of those emissions has not been addressed uh in our state so and you know i would argue that had we not been out there had measurements not been taken this story wouldn't have ever existed um, because no one would have had any data uh, to understand was there um, a high level exposure and what was the the consequence i wanted to mention just this particular instrument at the time, it was um, uh, a pilot uh, instrument, a uh, proprietary instrument from a group called Entanglement Technologies. Um, it's a really interesting instrument because it actually has um, two different modes. Um, the one mode is uh, a screening mode, and then another it can actually go into um, uh, an 
analytical mode where you can actually um, speciate different volatile organic compounds. And this is important because it's able to get down to part per trillion level um, areas of detection, which is important on the, on the human health side. And obviously um, this led to um, lots of, of stories in the news. And this is really what um, I think got everyone interested um, in air quality and put it back at the, at the top of the radar. In one week, um, 46 facilities across 13 counties reported over um, 4 million pounds of, of airborne emissions that were outside their permits. Uh, this, just to put it in context, is more than six months worth of pollution happening in, um, in, a, in seven days. And another reason why this is important is that the state environmental agency had actually shut down the stationary monitoring network in the region to try to protect it from uh, damage from the hurricane. So at the time where we have the um, worst issues with regard to air quality, we have the least amount of information about what's in that air. Uh, and so it really brought home um, this notion that uh, we really need to, to have better information about, um, uh, about the air in these, in these instances. And then again, um, more information about uh, high levels of chemicals found, um, and it was a it really catapulted us into this um, area of measuring air quality um, after disaster response. This is uh, just an example of some of the visualization um, that we have from that particular campaign. This Manchester community can see. Um, it's actually surrounded by that industrial facility. Um, it's also on the other side of it, if you can see at the bottom there, is a rail yard. So they're really closed in uh, by a lot of industrial activity. Um, and these, um, this often um, puts this, uh, this particular community at risk to a number of different um, uh, challenges. And then, um, you know, it's sort of like, oh, well, yeah, that was just sort of a one-off um, incident. Um, we, you know, probably only happen every 10, 20 years. Well, literally the next year, we had a massive chemical fire in Houston where the, actually a, um, a valve on one of those large storage tanks caught fire. That fire could not be put out for six days. Um, it ended up burning 18 of those 80,000 gallon tanks um, that were storing naphthalene. Uh, and what happened was this, uh, once the fire was extinguished, that fire had actually been combusting those volatile organic compounds. So once the fire was out, you had massive concentrations of benzene that were being released into the air. Um, there were three shelter in place orders and the local school was shut down for a week, as well as um, lots of different um, areas around um, this, this particular neighborhood of Deer Park. At, during this particular campaign, we had already been through Hurricane Harvey, so we were a little more prepared in terms of deployment of sensors and monitors. Um, we actually partnered with the Houston Health Department, Baylor College of Medicine, um, and we put out um, 20 clarity sensors almost overnight, uh, and they were measuring PM 2.5 and NO2. The PM 2.5 was the um, compound of concern while the fire was burning. Uh, if you saw those, that black smoke, it was um, four to 5,000 uh, feet in the air, and you could see it 100 miles away. So it was a massive fire. Uh, and, um, and so we were able to deploy these units very quickly. Um, it's, it was challenging because of the, um, as you all know, the needs um, for those instruments um, once they're deployed. So they need to have um, some way to be powered, some way to get that information um, back so that it can be used. Um, we also had a mobile campaign. This was similar to what we had done um, following Hurricane Harvey. Um, where we were trying to measure um, benzene around that facility. And just, you know, one of the things about, well, why is an NGO partnering with the health department for the city of Houston? Well, 
in part, it's because our state environmental agency is not um, a disaster response agency. And so even though they have some equipment to go out and measure uh, different concentrations of compounds, that's not their day-to-day -day, um, role. And so um, there's a gap there in terms of being able to understand um, what is in the air um, following these kinds of, of massive uh, events. And even a state report um, showing that they actually miss a lot of the very important uh, pollution spikes that occur um, in these uh, uh, during these events. Getting back to the visualization, it's fine to go out and measure and to be collecting this this information, but how do you communicate that to the public? After the ITC fire, it was our second major um, high uh, concentration of benzene in the Houston region. We worked with Rice University in the city of Houston to understand more about, okay, well, how can we give more information to the communities themselves about whether they're at risk uh, from the, the concentrations around those facilities or uh, are, they, um, uh, are they far enough away um, that the exposure um, may not be of as, as much concern. And then um, on the health side of it, a lot of our um, health-based standards are based on either an acute exposure, which is considered like an eight hour or a 24 hour, or a chronic exposure, which is more like a year. So if you have a health-based threshold where your one hour standard is 180 part per billion, what happens if you get a five minute sample that's a thousand? Um, is it of concern or is it not? Uh, one of the things that happened um, actually after the ITC fire was that they were getting very high concentrations in short time frames, um, but some of the agencies were reluctant to do anything because they technically didn't cross that threshold of um, the health-based standard that the state had put forward. And so, again, it's another issue where we have to understand, okay, well, we're collecting the information can we use it in a way that some action is going to, to happen? Um, and so we worked on this visualization tool. It uses um, meteorological information as well as um, handheld uh, data, instrument, uh, handheld measurements um, from instruments taken on the ground to um, provide these, um, you see these um, ovals here, which is in the, with the wind direction, you can see the little arrows, where you might expect those concentrations and that, that air to be. Um, and then we put together um, a, essentially an, a decision tree about, or an action plan for what happens if you were to get um, certain measurements over a certain period of time. That's what's in the, the green, yellow, orange, and red. So if you are out there just to investigate how you need to communicate it, whether you should issue a shelter in place or um, even evacuate. I just wanted to show that particular tool in the context of the ITC fire. So had that tool been in place, um, the, the ovals here are um, around the uh, stationary monitors that um, are in the, the city. Um, and so you would have seen there at the bottom, the orange oval, uh, that that would have triggered, should have triggered some particular action um, on the part of um, local officials. So to transition a bit um, from kind of that disaster response, um, other uh, areas of, of EDF were actually working on looking at, well, how can we understand more about baseline concentrations of different pollutants around the country? And so one of the first projects that we did was actually in partnership with um, uh, Google Earth Outreach, where we outfitted the Google Street View cars with, uh, it's actually a Picaro instrument that's able to um, measure methane. And the purpose of this uh, campaign was to understand, can we detect leaks um, in pipes around US cities? Uh, and can we help prioritize um, the size of those leaks so that they can be addressed? 
Uh, we were doing this work in um, cooperation and collaboration with some of the utilities across the country. And the benefit of that, obviously, was that um, we had everyone at the table um, who was needed to be able to, to address some of these issues. And so, as you might imagine, in some of the cities where the infrastructure is older, like Boston, um, we had we uh, were able to determine um, lots of different lakes and to help prioritize those. Um, and then in places like Indianapolis, those are newer pipes, there are actually fewer leaks. So understanding more about um, baseline emissions, even from uh, just uh, natural gas pipelines, is something that's incredibly important. As you all recognize, uh, methane is uh, the most potent of the greenhouse gases, and so um, as an organization, EDF is, um, I would say, laser focused on reducing methane concentrations uh, from a variety of sources. And so this was really um, part of um, our work to understand more about how big is this issue across the country. Once that campaign had, had um, gotten off the ground in light of the work that we had done with um, benzene and some of those other uh, pollutants, we actually, um, the next phase of that was to see whether we could measure more traditional pollutants using that Google car um, as the, the vehicle to, to capture those, um, those measurements. So we outfitted the, the, the Street View car with um, instrumentation that could measure black carbon, NO, and NO2. And these were using um, really fast response sensors. The initial project started out in Mountain View, California, because that's where Google is based. Um, and in that initial study, we drove over 400 unique miles of road um, for a total of more than 14,000 uh, miles total. Uh, and each road and, and segment was sampled more than 30 times. So what we found was that there were some areas across the, um, the drive area that were five to eight times higher in terms of um, pollution than in other parts of the cities. And many of the neighborhoods had higher levels of pollution um, than were measured at the central regulatory monitor. So that's an important, um, I think, point there, that even if you have a great um, uh, stationary network, you might not be capturing the, um, the neighborhood level concentrations, so the, the concentrations that people are actually breathing. Um, because this work was done in California, we were actually able to partner with Kaiser Family Foundation, and we were able to analyze the electronic medical records of more than 41,000 people um, in this, the area where we were driving. So we were able to link air pollution exposures with health outcomes. And what we found was that elderly residents, so those that were over 65, living in areas in West Oakland um, with the highest concentrations of NO2 specifically would have greater than 40% risk of cardiovascular disease than those who lived in less polluted areas of the neighborhood. So this is neighborhood level exposures, um, something that's never been um, demonstrated um, to this rigor before in terms of having that very granular air quality data combined with that very personal health data. We um, drove the Google cars in Houston. Um, that was a, a subsequent city following the, the California campaign. Houston is a much bigger city, so we were the areas highlighted here were the areas where we drove. Texas is actually um, the least insured state across the, the nation. And so we didn't have that um, very fine uh, insurance data to compare to the health data. But, you know, it's just um, to show that it takes, you know, the, the collection, the collaboration of lots of different agencies working together to really have a good understanding of what does this mean in terms of the, um, the implication uh, to human health. Now, EDF's uh, goal was um, never to um, just continue driving all over the country across all the cities. Really, what we like to do is we like to go in, demonstrate that, hey, this concept can be done, we can implement it, it can be successful and can give us useful information. Um, and then we want it to um, be adopted, uh, you know, broadly. 
So we did a pilot um, again with the health department for the city of Houston, where we were actually able to install sensors on regular city of Houston vehicles. So these were vehicles that are just out driving around as part of their daily um, city uh, business. And we were actually able to collect information that they were actually able to collect information that they were then able to use um, with regard to understanding more about the, the pollution around individual facilities. So in the, the picture at the bottom um, right there, that's actually a metal recycling facility in Houston. Um, the health department had been monitoring that facility because of concerns of PM uh, that was coming from that metal recycling facility. The city was actually able to use the information that they collected from that mobile campaign uh, to um, help um, strengthen the permit uh, that uh, the state actually ended up issuing to the specific facility. That would not have happened had they not um, had the kind of data to um, show that yes, the, um, the activities at this facility are increasing um, concentrations of, of different pollutants. So um, the, I think one of the things that um, we, we recognized from uh, the work that we did with the city was that um, it's all well and good for them to, to do a pilot project. This was the health department of Houston. And once COVID hit, um, the notion of going around and collecting information around indiv individual facilities sort of went out the window. Um, and so that's one thing to consider as we're looking to um, develop these partnerships is that the responsibility um, of this work really needs to, to have a home somewhere. Um, and it needs to have a home uh, in, in who's responsible for it, who's going to make sure that's getting used, who's going to make sure that the equipment is, is being managed and so forth. Um, all of that information helped us to um, understand that really what is needed and what the communities want, the communities that we work with want, is they want to know the, the quality um, of air in their individual neighborhoods. And so um, we worked with a community called Pleasantville and a, a 501c3 that is stationed there. It's, it's called um, Achieving Community Tasks Successfully, or ACTS. Um, and they wanted to install and manage their own um, monitoring network. So we helped to site some of those monitors. So um, for example, next to railroad tracks, um, next to highways, uh, there's one at the community center, there's one near senior living apartments, and they wanted to be able to understand the quality of air uh, at all times. <clears throat> this is, uh, these were, um, again, clarity monitors that were initially um, set forward. Um, this is a, an example of the dashboard that they see um, for the different monitors. This is a, um, the dashboard for one particular monitor. Uh, and you can see that um, this is reporting, uh, because this is a, a community network, it, it wasn't necessarily helpful to show the individual, you know, microgram per meter cube reading. It's more about, well, where does this fall in terms of the air quality index? Should I be worried about air quality today or, um, or is it a good air quality day? Uh, and so that's how the, the dashboard is set up. Um, I will say that one of the things that we noticed with these low cost sensor networks, and this is not specific to clarity, but um, I wanted to show this slide because I think it it does a good job of of demonstrating it, which is a lot of these low cost sensors. Um, they work well within a certain range, but if you're outside of that range, um, they start to go a bit haywire. Um, it's also important about calibrating. Um, the equipment, because some of the monitors, and we've noticed this with uh, the purple air uh, network, they tend to read um, higher than some of the regulatory monitors. And so figuring out how do we calibrate this equipment so that we're getting the best information possible, and can we use it? Is it reliable to be able to make um, decisions? 
So we actually worked uh, with Clarity quite a bit to um, help understand, um, you know, what, why is it um, within this, does it operate sort of fairly well within this specific range, um, but then when you get to the really high concentrations, which is what everyone's concerned about, um, you know, the, the certainty, um, the uncertainty around those measurements uh, actually increases. And so what we did um, to help address the calibration issue is that we actually calibrated the instruments for a month with the regulatory monitor that was in um, one of the regulatory monitors that was actually closest um, to this is a map of Mexico City, but this what we did was similar in Houston. Um, where those monitors and you can see them in that bottom left picture that big trailer is the regulatory monitor and you can see that we have like 20 of those sensors that are. Um, uh, that are being calibrated um, next to it and then once those sensors were calibrated then they were deployed um, to those different locations across the community and that really enabled us to. Um, uh, be able to make those corrections it's a manual cor correction that actually clarity does uh, that they then provide the, the calibrated data um, at the end. And this just shows again the the hour, hourly um, aqi for uh, a few months back in in 2020 and you can see that there are times when um, the concentrations of. Uh, uh, PM in the in the neighborhood um, do reach areas of of concern, particularly um, what the communities um, are are interested in. Again, getting back to visualization, we can't expect the community members to be um, analyzing, tracking um, the the information, understanding about calibration curves and so forth. Um, without providing more of a context and some of that technical expertise. And so one of our most recent tools that we've developed is called the Air Tracker. Um, this is uh, essentially a tool where we are taking data from these uh, monitors and helping to provide information, again, uh, similar to that, to the benzene tool that I showed you, um, but to provide information to see, okay, well, we are seeing higher concentrations at this particular monitor. What is the source or what are the potential sources? What is the geographic area um, where this pollution is, um, is um, coming from? And if I can, I can show this short video. When spending time outside of our homes, our offices, and our schools, we all enjoy breathing fresh air. But there are some things we can't see, things that are harmful to our health. Invisible pollution moves through the air, traveling downwind, damaging our lungs, hearts, and even impacting our brains. Pollution sources may not be right under our noses, but their impacts can be widespread felt next door, down the street, and across town. What if we could make that pollution and where it comes from visible in real time? We've designed a tool so that you, citizen sleuths, concerned community members, healthcare workers, business owners, regulators, and environmentalists can hold polluters accountable. Built by expert environmental scientists, Air Tracker is a pollutant forensics tool designed to work in any city, detect any pollutant, and integrate into any city's air quality measurement system, all designed to empower people to identify those that pollute our air. Simply select a location to create a source area. The clear area reveals the most likely origin of the air traveling to your selected location. Air Tracker is the first of its kind, combining hyper-local data with advanced models so that anyone can identify sources of pollution and take action. Learn more about the sources that contribute to air pollution at globalcleanair.org. Okay, so that was um, 
just a little bit about the air tracker, obviously for a, um, a general audience. But I think the point is that we understand that we need those kinds of tools if we're expecting um, to be able to use the monitoring data um, in a way that's going to be meaningful and in a way that's going to be, um, uh, you know, science in the service of community, if you will. Um, from all the work that we've done, I guess I would just throw out um, some general recommendations about the importance of um, publishing papers. One of the things about publishing papers is that it's in the science um, peer reviewed literature and that gives you a lot of credibility about the quality of work that you're doing and why it should be used, why it could be relied upon um, for advocacy or for decision making um, across a, a lot of different agencies. So that is one thing that um, that we prioritize within our organization. Also, educating stakeholders. I think one of the most important elements of the work that we do is um, we meet regularly with community groups to understand more about what it is that they want. Um, if they understand more about um, the quality of air, what the sources are, um, why does the uh, clarity monitor um, uh, seem like it's higher than the regulatory monitor, those kinds of questions are really important. Um, um, producing reports about um, summaries of data, um, acquiring permissions. We wouldn't have been able to calibrate the um, community monitoring network at the city of Houston regulatory site had we not had a relationship with the city of Houston to be able to do that. Um, not anyone is just allowed to go in and um, set up a, a monitoring network near those um, near those regulatory sites. And then Obviously, all of this costs money and time, and so those capital expenses, um, we see a lot of uh, legislative bills, for example, that go through um, where they're, they want to um, put money toward, you know, 100, 1,000 new air quality monitors across the country. Well, that's great, except that the monitors in and of themselves are not going to um, give us what we eventually want, which is the ability to use that information. Uh, we need people analyzing the data, we need maintenance of those monitors, and then we need someone making decisions based on um, what they see. In terms of just technical considerations, some of the things that we've noticed with the, especially the low cost sensors that we've worked with, um, geographical considerations, some monitors uh, do not work well in Houston because of the high humidity, particularly on PM, it just sticks together um, and you get, um, you know, concentrations uh, that are much higher than than they actually are. So, you know, how the monitor works um, in Arizona versus somewhere that that's more humid um, is a is a consideration that range or limit of detection, understanding more about what is the optimum uh, range for which um, your instrument works? Who's going to deploy the monitors? Who's going to ma maintain them? You all are well aware of all of that. What about the data storage? Um, we try to make the information that we collect as transparent as possible. Um, part of that is because um, we want everyone to use the information, but that obviously costs money. Um, how do you make sure that the information is available in a way that's that's usable? Um, mobile versus fixed site. I think I advocate for both. Um, I don't think that one is, is better than the other. I think they complement each other. Uh, I think um, it's important to understand more about um, how those, those uh, monitoring networks can work together. Maintenance, obviously, um, local air agency engagement. One of the things that came up um, with our work after that ITC fire, the facility that burned um, ITC was actually in Harris County, which was outside the, the city limits um, of Houston. But we had a relationship with the city of Houston. We actually were working with them to take measurements around that facility. So they were driving technically outside the city limits of Houston. Um, when they started reporting data up to the central um, website that the that Harris County was managing, Harris County got nervous and called and said, hey, what are you doing over here? Why aren't you in the city? 
um, and the city actually left um, because they didn't want to, um, I don't want to say get in trouble, but they didn't want to um, put any additional pressure on the county. And so we had a perfectly good instrument um, that was taking good measurements, was providing information, but because there had not been an agreement in place between those jurisdictions, um, it made everything more, um, uh, more difficult in terms of being able to work together. Since that um, experience, we've been working with the city and the county. We've developed two interlocal agency agreements so that there's actually a plan, a protocol of how these agencies should be working together in this kind of uh, scenario. You wouldn't think that that would be necessary, but when you're talking about um, potential violations for these facilities, when you're talking about court cases, is the city, is Harris County going to file suit against this facility? Oh, well, whose data did they use? Um, those are all questions that come up that those agencies are um, particularly concerned about. Um, the, the city um, and the county really have to, um, you know, want to, to solve these kinds of problems and they need, um, uh, I think, the encouragement to, to do that. Obviously, calibration, um, selection of equipment, the resolution of the coverage area, even though Houston is one of the most, um, you know, would be considered one of the most monitored areas across the country. You know, I could tell you lots of examples of where uh, measurements that were in the, the local neighborhoods did not match um, what the nearby monitor, the nearby monitor could be five miles away. So you're just not getting um, that that granular of, um, of information in terms of, of air quality. And then, um, you know, one of the things that all of this work is supposed to do, right, is raise awareness about the importance of these measurements, um, why we need more investment, why we need more funding, more support for this work. I would say, um, you know, through our campaigns, um, actually after Harvey, there was an average of six to seven news stories over the course of two years um, around air quality. And I think um, all of that had to do um, because of the work that, that we were promoting. And I think that that is what puts pressure on elected officials um, to go in and, and make changes and to make investments. Uh, we actually had Administrator Regan um, come out as part of his uh, Journey to Justice tour um, last November. Um, you know, he saw these communities directly. He knew the work that they were doing with the community monitoring. Um, I mean, think about a community having to monitor air quality on their own. Um, it's, it's really inspiring um, because they have so many other issues to, to try to manage and then to take that on as well. Um, but these are the kinds of things that, that help. Uh, the community that we were working with, ACTS, they just received, um, you may have seen EPA released uh, $54 million in community monitoring grants a couple of weeks ago. Um, and ACTS in Pleasantville was actually one of the recipients of uh, one of those grants. So they are going to be conducting a mobile campaign um, over the course of three years to actually understand more about the volatile organic compounds, the benzenes, um, the xylenes, um, PFAS is, is obviously coming up as a big issue, um, ethylene oxide, formaldehyde. These are compounds for which there is not um, a, a stationary network um, that's been well established across the, across the country. Um, and so as these new pollutants emerge, as we learn more about the health implications um, about them, this is all stuff that, that we need to take into account as we're um, conducting these measurements. And then I wanted to just take uh, a couple of, of minutes um, here at the end to talk about how we're trying to understand all of this work in the context of disparities um, related to climate and health. If you're aware, uh, EPA has what they call environmental justice uh, screen, so EJ screen, which is a screening tool that captures um, a lot of environmental data, particularly around air quality um, and some um, uh, socioeconomic variables and provides uh, information about where are their priority areas across the country. That particular tool um, has about 14 indicators. Um, 
what we have put together is a tool called the Climate Vulnerability Index or CVI, where we've actually captured 184 indicators related um, to across seven different domains. So health, social and economic uh, indicators, infrastructure indicators, environmental indicators. Um, and we've coupled that with indicators for extreme events, um, uh, social and economic stressors related to, to climate change and health um, indicators related to climate change. So increase in infectious diseases, increases in heat related mortality, that kind of um, those kinds of, of data. And what we've done is we've compiled all that information um, in, into uh, an index score. And you can see that the, the total, um, this is a, a tool called um, toxic, toxicological prioritization or toxpi, where if you um, have the results of all of those indicators, what picture does it give you um, across the country? And we did a, a statistical test to see um, whether there were certain clusters or whether there were certain patterns that emerged across the country, um, given those different subdomains that I mentioned. And you can see that um, if you look at um, uh, climate uh, related health indicators, social and economic risks, for example, um, the southern part of the United States, not surprisingly, shows up. Um, if you look at extreme event uh, risks uh, and social and economic uh, issues, you can see kind of the, the Midwest and the, and the West um, pop up as um, being uh, as, as have, having those higher index scores. And the idea of this is that we're able to um, understand more about the factors that are driving uh, the variability and the risks across the, the country. Um, this, is, this is at the census track level. So this is actually some of the highest resolution um, information that is available um, looking at these indicators. Um, and the idea of this tox pie tool is that based on the size of those individual pieces of pie, you're able to determine what is driving that, that total vulnerability. So in Harris County, we have um, actually three of some of the highest ranking census tracts across the country. Um, and we have been looking into what is, is driving um, those high scores. And if you're able to understand more about, well, what is driving the risk, the vulnerability, how can you prioritize um, what you can do about it, um, then you can make the case for increase, increases in investment and increases in um, activity to address it. So this all works with our air monitoring information because a lot of the communities um, that we're working with, so specifically um, Pleasantville and uh, Galena Park and um, Fifth Ward actually, I mean, there, there's like been a cancer cluster identified in our fifth ward neighborhood, um, in part um, because of, or they, it's believed that it's um, uh, in part because of a creosote exposure um, from an old rail facility. But this is the kind of information that coupled with information about air quality, those um, exposures that continue to happen over time, um, that we can take that information and um, use it in a way where there's um, community action planning. They can develop these action plans for how do we make the, the community, how, do, how does the community address these issues? Um, how do we prioritize disadvantaged communities? I'm sure you're all aware of the Justice 40 um, initiative where 40% of the benefits of um, some of the, the funding that's come down through the latest pieces of legislation, the IIJA and IRA, are supposed to benefit um, underserved, underrepresented communities. What, how do you define those areas? Um, and that's all of, of what is at the heart of the work that we do, is trying to um, raise more awareness about um, how do you identify these areas um, where there needs to be additional prioritization. And I will stop there and um, take some questions if there are any. So thank you so much. Yes.
would would you advise us you know we're largely a fixed site monitoring network would you advise us that we you know consider discuss a rapid mobilization monitoring capability you know to our program i mean i think that would be an excellent addition to um the work that you all do um you know one of the things that i was also thinking about at the beginning of this is you know i did not realize the coordination across all the different agencies that's part of nadp and um you know i noticed that um there are not very many local agencies i didn't see any ngos i didn't see community groups like I think it would be useful um, to try to expand the network of stakeholders that you all interact with more regularly um, to include those um, those groups, because obviously no one has the you know budget to manage a stationary network issue deployments. Um, you know those deployments are hard to do um, one of the things that was such a challenge is. Okay, so you're going to go drive a van after a hurricane. Okay, well, that street's flooded. What are you going to do? The community's on the other side of this bridge that you can't get across. Um, there are all kinds of just practical things that are, are challenges when, um, when those events happen. And so having that network of stakeholders and having those um, um, partnerships in place is is really key that's that really was the difference between sort of you know kind of hurricane harvey which was our first experience we you know had no idea what we were going to find i mean i couldn't believe when they took the first measurement and it was so high i mean it was it was um remarkable uh but then you know the next event it's like okay well we already had this group of people that we knew we knew that what their capacity, we knew their expertise, and we knew how to use it more effectively. I feel like having that, um, you know, building out that kind of a program within an ADP, you know, just even a quarterly call or something um, would be, I think, useful so that someone knows who to call um, or, hey, they've had a network going for 35 years. Why don't we check and see if there's been any um you know there are any signals that we can um determine from the the data that are already there i think that would be really <laughs> yeah of course I, I would say yes i think that that would be a great addition to your program i think one thread that i've heard through your remarks has been about the importance of partnerships and collaborations and networks just even in your response to that question and so i just am curious have you partnered with Robert Bullard and the folks over at Texas Southern and any of your work in Houston, given his, you know, decades of involvement with EJ. Yes, um, we love Dr. Bullard. He's actually on our Texas advisory board um, and we work closely. Um, usually I have a sheet of um, our collaborators, but we work um, closely with um, Dr. Bullard and, and Texas Southern um and all the community groups to help um they actually were partners in building out the climate vulnerability index while that was um you know a, an academic engagement uh it was actually the inspiration of it in part was um, from the community groups themselves because it's information that they're using um for example they used it in the proposal that they wrote to try to secure those resources for the community monitoring uh funds that epa released um and so that's something where we feel like we're um, helping to add value um, and helping the communities achieve um, the work that they want to do um, but yeah they're they're critical partners um in in all the work that we do uh and and yeah we cannot do this work without i think the support of of communities for sure Hi, um, I appreciate all the great work that you're doing and thank you for coming. Um, I have a question about uh, what are some of the ways that you guys get the message out or maybe even struggles um, with getting like, for instance, the the alert out that there's really high amounts of benzene out in the air to these communities. Yeah, I mean, that I think is the trickiest um, part. I mean, during the ITC fire, we had schools. Um, we have a couple of projects at schools. Uh, measuring indoor air quality actually and they were calling us saying should we be coming to school um and you know we're a nonprofit. 
our role is not to say, oh, you shouldn't be going to school because of the air quality. Yet at the same time, we had some of the most um, important data that anybody had to help make those determinations. And so, um, I mean, in my mind, I think uh, having that scientific, again, it comes down to like scientific credibility. Um, how do you collect that information? How do you present it in a way um, that is compelling um, and that makes someone, uh, you know, really take note. I'll say that after the campaigns and actually after the community monitoring that Pleasantville installed, the state environmental agency has now um, cited a regulatory monitor in Pleasantville. And I think part of the reason for that is that they do not want to be caught sort of on their heels where the residents, the communities have more information than the state environmental agency. If there's nothing scarier than, you know, to the state environmental agency anyway, than the community groups saying, hey, we have our own information and, um, you know, it's, you know, they don't have any anything to, um, the, the state environmental agency has really, um, you know, kind of, in a, in a way behind. Uh, so I think that all of this work is um, is empowering the communities in a way that that they have their own information and their own data so that they um, can make decisions. And our communications, um, I would say that most of the time we what we want to do is amplify the lived experience of the communities that are on the ground because it's not, and this gets back to our equity and justice um, work. I don't live next door to the facilities. I shouldn't be the one quoted in the paper about, oh, this is terrible, you know, while someone else is breathing that air because they live next door to the facility. And so it's trying to shine a spotlight on those personal stories like this, this information, this work matters because it's impacting someone's um, someone's life. And, and so that is how our team at least has, has approached the work was, um, look, we wanna provide the information, but we wanna provide it in a way um, that's useful. I'll share just one story about, um, you know, I think everyone wants to think that, oh, well, you just provide the information and then all the problems get solved. and like that is never <laughs> it's like yeah you have the information and then there's 12 other things that have have to happen um one of the things that we did one of the projects that we did with a community group was um we helped to um test some of the this is after the flint michigan where there's a lot of concern around lead and water and so um one of our community groups had um had some lead testing in their um, homes and high lead concentrations were found in several of those homes. And one of the things that um, that resulted from that is, okay, well, if your home has high concentrations of lead, there is a lead abatement program that the city of Houston runs, and you're supposed to refer that case to the city, and then they could come out and do some sort of abatement. Well, if that homeowner is behind on their taxes or hasn't paid on their paid their taxes or if um you know that house has been condemned and no one's supposed to be living there but there are four kids that still live there then the city says well we can't do anything about it because we aren't able to implement our program to those homes and so it's sort of like well we you know, yeah, the lead is high. That's not enough. It's like you have to be able to solve the rest of the problem. Um, and I think that's where at least um, I find it to be the most challenging um, work that we do, but also the most important because it that's not, you know, it doesn't end there. You have to take it all the way to, okay, we need some sort of resolution here where um, everyone is living uh you know has the opportunity to to live with clean air clean water very interesting thank you hey uh thanks for the great talk dr Kraft. um so i have a, a question just to kind of gauge your thoughts on this i think we saw this with both eto as well as pfas that 
you know, a new iris assessment comes out, we get these new, you know, risk, risk values, but then the measurements have to catch up and it takes about, you know, five years. Do you have any thoughts as to what sort of coordination can be, you know, how we can enhance the coordination as far as those iris assessments and the measurements that will follow in order to, you know, collect valid measurements? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. Um, I mean, the ethylene oxide issue has been so back and forth, right? Because um, some of the, the cancer risk values, I mean, uh, one of the things that, one of the challenges that we have is that um, EPA had a risk threshold for ethylene oxide. Oh, well, the state of Texas issued their threshold, their risk threshold for ethylene oxide. And guess what? It was, you know, um, four times less health protective. Um, well, where are all the facilities that are releasing ethylene oxide? Oh, they're, you know, a lot of them are in Texas. And so having this, um, um, this issue of uh, risk thresholds for, you know, for the federal government versus what the states are doing, um, a lot of these compounds, as you know, are not, um, criteria pollutants. And so there is no federal based um, health threshold. And so ultimately it comes down to, well, what is the state willing to do? Because really through the Clean Air Act, it's this cooperative federalism that's supposed to be happening between the states and the federal government that allows for this air quality management. Um, so I think, um, you know, one thing is having more clarity around um, and more work around those um, federal health based thresholds um, and guidance values for some of these compounds like ethylene oxide. I think that's critical. Um, I also think having uh, some way to hold uh, facilities accountable um, in the same way, you know, there are facilities in California that have a lot more um, requirements within their individual permits than say the facilities in Texas. Um, and that's by design, right? You know, Texas um, wants to be open for business all the time. And so a lot of times anything goes on these permits. Um, and even when you come up with a good reason to challenge the permit, it still gets um, approved. That ITC facility that, <laughs> I mean, there were billions of dollars of damage. They still got another permit. To operate. So um, those are, I think, are the challenges that are out there. On the monitoring side, um, it's, it, I do think that, um, that it takes too long to get the information around the exposures um, or around the concentrations. Um, and I'm not sure, we, we haven't solved that yet. Um, but I think that's where there's a role, like for this organization, um, to help provide some ideas about how we could get there. And then if we were to build out sort of a stakeholder network um, that was able to communicate, yeah, these are, this is what we need on the ground. These are the timely issues that we've got to address. Um, let's figure out a way to do that. And if there's a way to, to have that leadership, um, have you all manage some of that leadership, I think that would be amazing honestly um at least on the on the data side uh, i think that could be um very compelling thank you um yeah i've really appreciated your talk thank you dr kraft um i have a question sort of on the other side which is when you talked about mountain view california i thought well there's no demographic differences in neighborhoods in Mountain View, California. I think of that as, I've never been there, but I think of it as a very wealthy community. Um, could you talk a little bit about how, how you found uh, demographic, economic, you know, DEI kinds of data for neighborhoods in Mountain View in particular? Because I'm, I don't have access to that database right now. I'd like to figure out how to find that kind of information for my community. Yeah, so um, I guess to clarify, so Google is based in Mountain View. The driving that we did was actually in West Oakland. Um, and so that was done in partnership with West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project, um, which is an EJ group um, there. Again, another critical um, partner to all of this work is the community on the ground understanding 
um, more about, um, you know, what is the lived experience? What are the day-to-day -day issues that happen there? Um, there is a lot of information around um, social vulnerability. So CDC has their SVI. Um, there are lots of different, Robert Wood Johnson um, has a 500 cities project where they've um, developed um, social vulnerability indexes and so forth. Um, our tool actually uses those um, indices. Uh, it, what it does is it uses the individual indicators within those indices um, instead of that, that one um, indicator uh, in part because we're able, we don't want to double count any of those indicators. So that's why we, we parsed them out. Um, but yeah, I, I guess one thing I will say about the, what we learned um, in, in Houston from the Google cars is that we actually saw higher concentrations um, in some cases of PM 2.5 in a wealthier part of town uh, in part because some of the pollution from the ship channel area, you know, was blowing there. And so this was information that no one really had a good line of sight. I mean, immediately you think about, oh, well, the greatest amount of pollution is going to be over by the ship channel. But when you're talking about secondary pollutants like ozone, you know, ozone's not formed necessarily. Um, and because it's a secondary pollutant, it's not necessarily going to end up um, where those precursors are released. Um, and so because of the work that we did, they're actually install installing a regulatory monitor in um, West Houston, which has traditionally been a more affluent part of town. Um, and that monitor, actually it's been up for a year, um, that is actually exceeding the federal health-based standard for particulate matter which, as you know, after three years, if it continues um, to, to have that trend, um, then Houston, which is currently in attainment for particulate matter, would, um, would be out of attainment. And again, this is information that, um, you know, you wouldn't have had with our existing um, stationary network. So another reason why you, I think it's helpful to have that combination of the, the fixed site and the mobile, because you know, the fixed site is one point in time, and so was the mobile. <laughs> um, but, you know, having that as much geographic coverage as you can possibly get is so critically important. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Craft, thank you. Really